Um, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, thank you to London School of Pediatrics to give me this opportunity to um, teach you guys um, on this fantastic platform. Um, I think it is really great to see uh, that um, at seven o'clock in the evening, uh, there are so many people who are actually joining in. Uh, so thank you for your time. Um, I'm going to share my screen, but before I share my screen, um, I hope you all have your um, smartphones on you um, because we are going to do an interactive session. So um, there will be some polling uh, and there will be some question and answers. And obviously at the end of the session, um, we will go through the question and answers, um, questions that you have put through um, in the chat box. Um, so let me just share my screen. Right, I hope you're able to see this. So we're going to go through um, in the next um, um, hour or so, we are actually going to cover the pathophysiology of fetal circulation. Um, we will talk about the clinical assessment um, of adequacy of preterm circulation. We'll uh, talk about the causes of hypertension. Again, I'm sticking to preterm babies in this, so it's not pertaining to term babies. Uh, we'll look at the approach to treatment, and then we'll look at um, some insertion and care of central lines, and we'll have a little bit of a quiz at the end of it um, as well. So if you have your um, smartphones on you, um, please click on the QR code that is there on your screen. Um, so you will be then uh, taken to a Slido poll. And what I want you to actually answer is the multiple choice question. And I want you to answer, uh, to give me the answer for what is cardiac output determined by? This is not pertaining just to preterm, this is for everybody. What do you think the cardiac output is determined by? I'm going to give you 30 seconds. So the answers are preload, um, myocardial performance, heart rate, afterload, or fluid balance. What is it? What is our cardiac output determined by? Okay, I've got 12 responses so far. I've got definitely more than that uh, on the call. So um, I would definitely request everybody to take participate in this. Any more? Hi everyone, if you just take a, use your phone and put it on the QR code, you should be able to get a direct link to the quiz if you're struggling with that. Thank you, Aramie. Okay, uh, we'll move forward. Uh, so, um, 90% or 87% of you have said preload, uh, 67 myocardial performance, 69% um, heart rate, 31% afterload, and 13% uh, fluid balance. Um, so the correct answer is, apart from fluid balance, um, everything else actually determines our cardiac output. So your preload, your afterload, your heart rate, and how your myocardium is functioning. Okay, so that all, all those components are really important when we are looking at um, uh, your cardiac output. Okay, go ahead. Apologies. So what we are 
uh, going to look at um, what is a preterm myocardium um, it looks like. So um, on the right side of the of the diagram, you have um, a term myocardial uh, myo myofibril contractile unit. And on the left side, you have the preterm. So you can actually see in, in, in just a pictures form how different it is. So you have the thick and the thin filaments. Um, and then you have your calcium releasing channel, so which is all actually cl very closely together. And this calcium, the L type, the calcium channels, they are useful in pumping in the calcium that actually helps with the myocardial contractility. In a preterm baby, what happens is that that calcium channels is actually situated very far apart. Um, to the thick and the thin filaments. So that actually impairs your myocardial contractility in a preterm infant. It's a very, in a very simplistic term, that's what I'm explaining it to you. This whole contractility is much more complex than that, but this is the basic thing that you need to remember that you, you your kind of, the whole myocard, myofibril contractile unit is very different in a term as, as compared to a preterm infant. So what happens because of that is that the preterm myocardium is very poorly tolerant to increases in the afterload. This point, remember this point, because we are actually going to reflect on this when we are talking about how to treat your hypotension in a preterm infant. Okay, so it is very poorly tolerant to your increase in the afterload. You have an impaired diastolic function. So you can actually imagine that your baby has got a heart rate of 150 to 180 beats per minute. So, and you're contracting with such a fast rate, what you normally see is your diastolic function actually then gets compromised. You have, babies have a resting very high peripheral vascular tone. Um, so again, that affects your, that it increases your afterload um, in, in, a, in a myocardial, uh, in, in a myocardium. Uh, the myocardium also has few adrenergic innovation. Um, so what happens is they have less receptors, less innovation. Uh, so the normal medications that are used for high, treating hypotension, actually they are more refractory uh, in a pre preterm myocardium. You have an immature hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Again, that forms the basis of one of the management aspects of preterm hypertension. And then obviously you have the additional component of your patent duct, the ductus arteriosus and the patent, patent foramen ovale who, through which you can actually have lots of shunting. And as a result, that may actually compromise your blood flow. Let's kind of step back a little bit more in terms of understanding how it is different or your preterm kind of um, uh, circulation is different from a term circulation as well as in an infant. So this is again a very simplistic diagram of looking at what happens in a fetus. So in a fetus you have your um, blood flow to your upper parts of the body as well as the lungs and then you have got this mixing um, uh, at your um, PDA and at your PFO level. And then you have this placenta, uh, which actually is a very low pressure circulation. So you've got very low pressure circulation coming through the placenta. It's coming into the, um, uh, the, the umbilical arteries, coming into the um, body, getting exchanged or getting basically uh, uh, shunted across the PFO as well as the PDA um, and then getting circulated in the head and the rest of the body and then going back into the placental circulation. When a baby is born, that low pressure circulation which is there in the placenta is actually cut off and then you have this clamping of the umbilical cord and you have basically increase in your peripheral vascular resistance and as we talked about that the peripheral vascular tone innate peripheral vascular tone in a preterm baby is anyways quite high so you will actually then have this heart that has to all of a sudden pump against that increase in your afterload um, as well as all the blood is now actually coming in directing into the into the heart um, and that the heart needs to actually now pump all that blood into the lungs where the pulmonary vascular resistance is slightly on the higher side still um, and then have to actually get the oxygenated blood circulating through the body so again there are lots of these changes that are happening to the infant, to the, to the fetus, when it's transitioning from a fetal circulation to a neonatal circulation. Again, looking at determinants of your 
cardiac output and whether you actually have adequate cellular metabolism. As we actually talked about in the first slide that your cardiac output is determined by your afterload, which is again determined by your systemic vascular resistance, what vasopressors that we have, and also the, um, uh, the, ca cardio the, the cardiac contractility, the, heart, the muscle of, of the heart. So you've got the afterload, then you have the preload, which is basically looking at your diastolic function, your hydration status, and if there are any effusions. So again, these are pathologies that actually can affect that. And you're looking at your contractility. So if you're acidotic or if you're septic, if you are actually contra contracting against positive pressure ventilation, the baby is ventilated, and how, what is the catecholamine release that's happening? And then your heart rate, again, in sepsis, in pain, in arrhythmia, all these things are actually increasing. So all these kind of four factors will affect your cardiac output. And once any of these actually pathologies are going on, um, then we have to look at what your blood pressure is, what your systemic vascular resistance is, and then looking at what your cardiac output is. And then we have to actually understand whether you have adequate hemoglobin in your, in your body and whether your, there is any lung, plus or minus there is any lung disease or not. And that is actually then affecting your cardiac output and in turn your cellular metabolism. So this is all kind of interlinked with each other that helps to determine kind of, we have to just understand if any of these factors are getting affected, how does it affect your blood pressure, your systemic vascular resistance, your oxygenation, and how much hemoglobin that you have in your body to be able to deliver that adequate cellular metabolism. So we're going to go through the causes of hypotension in preterm infants. So we um, generally tend to see that about 30 to 40% of our infants, preterm infants, they will actually have hypertension. They will have hypertension immediately after they are born, um, as well as if any other pathologies are going on later on, they will be affected by hypertension. Why do we worry about this? Um, so we do worry about hypertension because we know that it is associated with long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes, adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes. Is it actually that simple in terms of whether if you have a low blood pressure, it equates to um, a, a adverse outcome? It actually isn't that simple because blood pressure is just a number. And we actually have to think about whether it is a low blood pressure that is actually causing a problem or it is basically the end organ perfusion that we are worried about more and how we measure that end organ perfusion in a baby. And that actually determines your, your kind of long-term outcome. So if you have a baby with a low blood pressure, but otherwise end organ perfusion is fine, they might be fine. But if you have a baby that has got a normal blood pressure, but has got end organ damage and end organ perfusion is, is impaired, then it can actually have effect on your short and your long-term outcomes. As I said, normal mean pressure, that's what we always are asked to look, oh, what is the, what's the gestation of the baby? And that should be the mean and you should be fine. It actually isn't that simple. So normal mean pressure does not equal to normal blood flow. Okay, so that is, I think the take home message from this, I would definitely suggest that, yes, you look at the blood pressure, but you don't actually just look at the number and don't actually equate just to the gestation. You have to look at the overall how the perfusion is and what is the endocrine perfusion of that baby and how it is affecting. That is what you need to understand. Okay, so now I hope you have your um, smartphone still. And if you have, if you had clicked on the QR code before, you should actually be able to see the second question. Um, if not, then you can always click on the QR code again. And let tell me, um, it's again a multiple choice question. What are the three most common causes of hypotension in a preterm infant? I'm going to give another 30 seconds. Okay. 
Okay. So what are the three most common causes of hypotension in a preterm infant? Okay, so um, I'm glad people have said sepsis um, and PDA. Um, um, in the chat, if you are able to, um, I would like to know why actually you mentioned blood loss um, as the common cause of hypertension in a preterm infant. Yes, there are, there are, uh, but just wanted to understand your 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 thinking behind why do you say blood loss? Many puncture, absolutely. Okay, but do we actually? cause so much of if we are actually causing so much of blood loss that it is causing hypotension then we definitely need to actually think about ourselves isn't it in terms of how much we are bleeding these poor babies uh so definitely yes um it could be but i think it causes anemia more than hypotension do you not think ivh absolutely Okay, so, so so yes, sepsis, PDA, and I would say NEC um, more than blood loss. And the reason for that I can explain is um, you, you, you've mentioned correctly that yes, IVH can cause and we do take a lot of blood. But at the same time, it is not the primary cause of hypotension. Um, so a preterm baby when they are delivered, and especially now with when we are doing the delayed cord clamping, we hope that we are actually maintaining that circulation in a preterm baby. Um, if we are, we are actually taking bloods and the baby becomes anemic, but if the baby becomes hypotensive because of that, then again, that's something that we are, we are causing it iatrogenically. Um, NEC is more common as compared to IVH. So that's the reason that I would say that NEC will cause more hypotension. Um, and the, the, how we treat that hypotension, especially if you have IVH, is slightly different to what we, how we treat um, for NEC. I'm actually uh, glad that people have not said post-ductal ligation syndrome. Again, it's rare, but actually it does cause hypotension. But again, the pathophysiology of that hypotension is very different. Um, we can actually talk about it later on um, in the Q&A Q about the post-ductal ligation syndrome, which um, in centers, uh, the tertiary centers where um, we, we do actually do ductal ligation, we see that more often uh, than in any of the medical centers. Okay, now looking at clinical assessment of adequacy of um, your circulation. So first is heart rate. So the first aspect of a baby actually becoming a bit tachycardic um, uh, is, is basically babies trying to compensate for that low blood pressure. But as we talked about that, we, the baby is already running a very high heart rate. If the baby becomes more tachycardic, what happens is that you are not actually improving your hypotension, but and you're not improving your peripheral circulation and your perfusion. You're actually the baby's it doesn't help sometimes, but it is an indicator that something is going wrong um, and we need to treat it. So the indicator is that, yes, you're, you're, tach you're tachycardic, uh, but the baby, if you carry on being tachycardic, it will actually going to be adversely affecting your perfusion as compared to actually improving your perfusion. OK, blood pressure measurement. I think there is a lot of debate um, in terms of what is the accurate way of measuring a blood pressure and what is the accurate number that we need to think about gives you an accurate reading of that. Yes, OK, the blood pressure equates to a, 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 a good uh, peripheral perfusion. We always talk about mean, but over the course of the years, what I have actually now started to look at is more the systolic as well as the diastolic as a separate component and then looking at the mean. Because when you look at the blood pressure of a baby and you see that you have good systolics, but sometimes you have got low diastolics, which are actually pulling the mean down, you're actually not perfusing um, your end organs very well. So again, you have to look at systolic in its entirety. So it basically is a surrogate of adequacy of the contractile force and your cardiac output. 
Okay, it is mainly your systolic pressure is mainly determined by your preload and your afterload, and then how the heart is contracting. And preload, afterload, and your contractility are affected by various factors. So again, if you have a low systolic, then you need to think about these three factors and see, okay, how do I treat this? Okay, if you have a low diastolic. It basically reflects that your systemic vascular resistance is actually low, as well as your volume status is low. So this is what I'm talking about, like especially in 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 where you have very high shunts in PDA, um, then you will actually see that you have very high systolics because your afterload, your preload, and afterload is affected with with your shunts. But you have a very low diastolic, which actually is pulling your mean down, and you are actually compromising. Um, uh, your your mean blood pressure and also your diastolics can be low in if you have fluid loss so if you have sepsis uh, you will have low diastolic so again how you actually try and treat that diastolic low diastolic pressure is slightly different to how you actually treat your systolic pressures and then obviously you look at your mean so sometimes you will be happy oh yeah the mean is a, is a 26 weaker and the mean is 26 so all the systolics um, are very high and the diastolics are very low and that's why your mean is kind of coming towards that um, it's not actually a very good marker um, at all in terms of how you treat it. So you should not be actually driving your management of blood pressure just looking at your mean. Again, how you measure it is really important because in a baby who is septic or who has got um, NEC or who has got um, IVH or any reason for significant reason for low blood pressure, just doing a cuff blood pressure will actually not give you an accurate reading because obviously the it depends on the size of the cuff it depends on where it is measured as well so if you have large shunts and you're measuring the blood pressure in the lower limbs you obviously will have a different reading as compared to if you're measuring the blood pressure in your upper limbs and obviously the cuff size also determines how high or the low the blood pressure is. Sometimes we actually say, oh, can you just measure it on another cuff and we get a better reading and we are happy with ourselves. But sometimes actually, if you have a low reading, you need to actually kind of think about it. Is it the accurate measurement? Is it you're measuring with the accurate cuff, which is appropriate for that baby? And if you're not happy with that, then you need to actually think about, okay, do I need to invasively measure this blood pressure? So by inserting an arterial line, either it is peripheral arterial line or inserting an umbilical arterial line, if the baby is actually just born, will give you a much more accurate reading as compared to uh, of, of the perfusion of the of the baby if you're measuring it accurately. This is a table which we um, sometimes use, um, and this is actually looking at the third centile. So. Um, we look at the third centile, the lowest, that's the lowest centile, and then we get worried about, start, start, start to get worried about, it's like, okay, fine, this is the third centile, which we will be happy at. Um, and then if you are actually coming down towards the third, lower than the third centile, then you need to ask yourself, are they, are, is this blood, blood pressure adequate? Is there any end organ perfusion that we need to actually be worried about? Um, so again, this table is useful. Um, uh, I, I some, a lot of the times I will actually use it uh, just to kind of make sure that I am not over treating or under treating uh, a baby with um, antihypertensives um, or antihypotensives um, in this matter. Then further on with the clinical assessment, capillary refill time people say, but if you think about it, um, it is actually a very unreliable marker as well. So you will see a central capillary refill time saying, oh, the central capillary refill time is less than two seconds, but the baby is peripherally quite mottled or peripherally shut down. So again, you have to take the whole thing in context um, of the other pictures as well. So if you have a baby who's very tachycardic um, uh, and you have a baby with a very um, high peripheral capillary refill time, again, you're thinking, okay, fine, there's something wrong. The baby is actually um, hypotensive. We need to treat something. Other end organ that is really important is your urine output. So any baby, any preterm baby will have a very high urine output as the word go because you have the renal immaturity. So the babies will actually try and be, be out quite a lot of um, uh, urine in the first, at least in the first 72 to uh, 96 hours, so three to four days, the urine output is really, really high until the kidneys are maturing. Later on, when the kidneys are already mature and your urine output is actually dropping, then again, you need to be thinking about, okay, fine, what's going on over here? 
We see this a lot of the times in babies who have got a very large wide open duct and which is called diastolic steel that we see when you have a very high systolic, very low diastolic, that means you've got the runoff and the organs that actually are affected are the gut and the kidneys. And then you start seeing, when you look at the bloods, you, you start seeing that the creatine is creeping up um, and you have got a low urine output. That means that this diastolic blood pressure that the baby is having because of that, uh, because of the steel is affecting the end organs. And now you need to actually do something about it uh, to treat either the duct or actually increase the blood pressure by giving some inotropic support. The other laboratory markers that we look at is your lactate. Um, so when you are actually doing a blood gas, always, 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 as part of your CVS examination and uh, presentation, when you're actually presenting to in, in, in your ward rounds, um, combine the lactate with your kind of so cardiovascularly, the baby is stable, has got a normal lactate, because again, lactate is a surrogate marker of um, looking at your endorgan perfusion. So now let's look at your approach to treatment um, in a baby with hypotension. So I've actually mentioned over there volume. Uh, and we'll go through some of the medications and we'll just go through the kind of the basics of why we use and what effect these medications, different medications have on, on, pre, on a preterm baby. So role of volume is actually quite controversial um, in preterm hypotension. As we talked about, blood loss is not the most common cause of preterm hypotension. If it is a common, if it is a cause, especially if the baby is born because of abruption, definitely that you need to give volume because that is what is going to be replaced because the baby has less of it, you replace it and you treat it. But if baby is hypotensive, but nor more volumic, okay? So the volume, there is no reason to think that the baby actually has got a low circulating volume. Fluid bolus can actually be detrimental to this baby especially in the first 24 hours of life. So when the baby is born and you see, oh, baby is actually hypotensive. We see this so many times. The first thing that everybody thinks, oh, let's give a fluid bolus and see if the baby responds. Yes, you can give a fluid bolus, but not more than 10 mils per kilo. So we sometimes only give five mils per kilo and see whether the baby responds. Because normally if you have a normal volume and you're giving extra volume to that baby in the form of fluid bolus, we again talk about when we when I was uh, discussing about how the myocardium is so difficult and we find it so difficult to so there's, there's the contractility is so impaired. You put more fluid in the baby's body and then you will actually find that the myocardium is struggling. And that's why you actually have made things worse for that baby by giving extra fluid. So very, 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 very cautious when you are actually trying to treat this baby with fluid, especially if they have normal volume. So again, we say that liberal administration of fluid is not recommended because the immature myocardium will not absolutely cope with that extra fluid. If you are actually dealing with a baby who has got any C or sepsis, yes, again, you can actually give fluid volume to that baby. But again, be very careful in terms of how much fluid you're giving. If you're giving fluid, because obviously if they are septic, if they have NEC, they will have um, DIC, you will have to give blood products, you will have to give um, uh, FFP, you will have to give platelets. So those are all fluid as well. So by giving just 0.9% saline to this baby is actually not going to help at all. So if you're going to your 20 mils per kilo of fluid, fluid volume, um, that you want to give, okay, and to give a fluid bolus of 10 mils per kilo, okay, has not kind of caused too much of a problem, and we think the baby is septic, we give another 10 mils per kilo, think about um, colloids, rather than giving carry-on, giving crystalloids, because the baby will actually um, have third spacing, and it will actually, the, the heart will not cope with all that fluid volume, it'll just go in the peripheries, and then you'll have a baby who's really very, very puffy, the kidneys are obviously not working very well because you have hypotension, the urine output is decreased, and then you will just run into that, that kind of uh, uh, problems with, with trying to get rid of the fluid. Use albumin sometimes. We do use albumin. We use 4.5% albumin. 
Um, using a higher concentration of albumin, again, you need to be very cautious and you have to give it very slowly because you can actually cause pulmonary edema um, if you're giving higher concentration of, uh, of albumin in this. If um, you are again, so again, the other, other role of volume is if you think that you are actually using ionodilators, okay, then you need to actually think about, okay, if I give, if I give an ionodilator to this baby, will I be able to actually, is there enough fluid in the baby's body in, to be able to cope with that? Otherwise, you're just making things worse. So again, we'll go through this in a minute. Uh, so again, just thinking about what you're treating this baby and how you're treating um, and how much volume you need to give to this baby is really important. Looking at dopamine, okay, so dopamine is the most studied agent in, in, in neonates. I think we are, we, 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 we use it um, like peanuts, like basically every, every time the baby's had peanuts, oh, let's just use dopamine. That's, that's the go-to agent. It's actually not a very good agent, to be honest. There is a lot of now uh, research going on on dopamine and the effects of dopamine on a preterm baby. It is vasoactive. It actually is um, got mixed beta-1 and alpha um effects. But the problem with dopamine is it's very unpredictable. It is sometimes it will work, it sometimes it won't work. Which babies it actually works better is really difficult to know. So yes, a lot of baby, a lot of neonatologists will say, let's go to dopamine and then we'll see what happens. And then we then add on the next anotropic agents or kind of, um, uh, and then we then say, okay, fine, let's just come come off the, the dopamine. Um, and a lot of the times we see that we start off with dopamine, but back off from dopamine very, very quickly. And we are on, on the second line and third line agents very, very quickly. What dopamine does is it increases the systemic vascular resistance and it actually causes reduce in the cardiac output and organ perfusion. That's the effect that we really do not want. So there are lots of studies that actually say that, oh, let's give low dose dopamine, 2.5 micrograms per kilo per minute, five micrograms per kilo per minute, because we think that is probably the renal dose. We don't know, we really don't know. Um, sometimes, yes, we can try and think about, okay, let's let's try. If it is not working and it is causing adverse effects, back off very, very quickly. So you just can't start and then go away and then say, okay, fine, the baby is on dopamine and 24 hours will come and review. You have to review this baby within two to three hours to see what that effect is, what dopamine is actually doing to your, to your body. It also can sometimes increase your pulmonary vascular resistance. Again, if you have a baby that could potentially have pulmonary hypertension, I can use it with caution, okay? Again, if it is not working and your oxygen requirement is going up, your PaO2s are uh, deteriorating, then come off dopamine as quickly as possible. Noradrenaline is a, uh, is a second agent that I think we are using it now more and more. Um, uh, and sometimes we actually go for uh, noradrenaline than dopamine because we think what it actually does is it's a very potent vasopressor. It actually has got predominant alpha effects and it increases the systemic vascular resistance, especially if you have a baby who's got sepsis. Um, so you want to, what you want to do is basically just increase your peripheral vascular resistance and it, it causes the rise in the blood pressure. But again, it doesn't actually increase your cardiac output as such. So you always have to think about whether with noradrenaline, do you need to use another agent to increase that cardiac output. Sepsis and NEC, I think it's the go-to agent. Um, so we always try, if you have a baby with an NEC and sepsis, we would not start with dopamine. We'll actually start with noradrenaline and we'll just kind of increase the dose of noradrenaline and then try and see whether we need to add another agent, which we will come to in a minute. There's a lot of interest nowadays, especially in Europe. When I teach in the European courses, they actually talk more about vasopressin than uh, noradrenaline and dopamine, um, and for that matter, even adrenaline as well. So it is actually um, gaining more interest. It is used in refractory hypotension. So if you have a baby who's on 
dopamine, dobutamine, noradrenaline, adrenaline, um, and you're actually kind of um, giving hydrocortisone, and now you are kind of thinking about, oh, we need to actually go up and up on the adrenaline, but you are actually, your back is against the wall, and you have got high lactates because you've just peripherally squeezed that baby so much, you need to actually think, okay, something is not working. We need to actually think about whether we use another agent, vasopressin. It has got predominant uh, V1 receptors, which causes very significant systemic vasoconstriction. It also actually, the good thing about vasopressin is actually increases your, your, it causes pulmonary dilatation. And it basically does that by modulating your release of nitric oxide. So it doesn't increase it, it modulates it. It increases your nitric oxide release. And it is used in refractory hypertension and in pulmonary hypertension. So I said that we don't use it very often uh, in UK, but I think a lot of European countries, they, they have started to use this more and more. Adrenaline. Um, so again, if you are actually starting thinking of using adrenaline, you obviously have a baby who is an extremist. Um, and you are you have a uh, um, hypertension uh, which is actually not working, um, not responding to your kind of noradrenaline uh, or the dopamine, uh, and then you are starting. Okay, fine. We need to use adrenaline, and it has got kind of predominant beta one and alpha adrenergic effects. It is actually a combined inotropic, so it causes contractility, increased contractility in the heart, and also causes increase in the peripheral vascular resistance. So that's the reason that when you have started adrenaline, you will see that your lactates are going high. At low doses, it decreases your cardiac output. It, sorry, it increases your cardiac output at low doses, uh, and it is actually more effective in increasing your stroke volume and as well as your heart rate. Okay, so it is actually quite a potent um, uh, agent uh, to help with, with all these effects. But again, um, we have to be very mindful, especially in preterm babies. Um, if you are using adrenaline, especially at high doses, it actually can cause lots of problems. Um, and it also is actually a vasopressor. So as I said, that it actually causes the peripheral vasoconstriction as well as pulmonary vasoconstriction as well. Talking about dobutamine, again, so this is another agent that actually is used more in preterm infants than in term infants. It is a synthetic ionotropic agent. It has got predominantly beta-1 effects. It increases the stroke volume and your heart rate. So if you've had experience of using dobutamine in preterm infants, you will see as soon as you start dobutamine, the baby who had a heart rate of 150, 160, suddenly has jumped to 200. And the heart rate just causes increase, shoots the heart rate very, very high. Um, and that's how it increases the stroke volume uh, because again, your cardiac output, one of the determinants is, is your heart rate. It actually causes a uh, vasodilatory action in your peripheral vascular resistance. Um, uh, so you have, uh, it reduces the peripheral vascular resistance, causes vasodilatation. So if you're using dobutamine with adrenaline, it's, it's actually a counteracting in the actions of each other. So again, when you're actually combining two or three anotropic agents, you need to think about what you are exactly doing, because then if you're counteracting, if this is what the effect that you really need is as a constriction, then you should actually not be using dobutamine. But if you want to actually increase your, mainly the stroke volume, uh, then you should use uh, dobutamine. Preterm infants, as I said, that you, you're normal volumic most of the time. So dobutamine, that's why, is, is a good agent uh, to be using so that it actually helps with increasing your stroke volume. Um, if you use it in high doses, it actually causes hypotension. So again, if you are actually starting you've on 20 of dopamine, you're given 20 of dobutamine, your blood pressure is still not actually helping, uh, then you basically have overshot um, the use of dobutamine. You possibly are causing more hypotension uh, than actually treating the hypertension. This is the agent that I was talking about, that when you are actually using fluid volume, so if you want to use dobutamine, then sometimes just giving that extra fluid to that baby helps because if you have got less fluid in your body, if you don't have adequate perfusion, like an adequate fluid volume, then dobutamine actually will not cause. So just giving that slightly 10 mils per kilo and then you actually then start dobutamine, um, it actually helps really well. Um, and it is very useful in cold shock. 
um, in term asphyxia, as asphyxia, as well as pulmonary hypertension. So that is another agent that you can use in pulmonary hypertension because it's uh, because, uh, because um, it's causing um, uh, pulmonary vasodilatation. Uh, milrinone. Uh, milrinone is another agent uh, that actually is not used as much, but there are certain aspects um, of um, certain conditions where milrinone can be used. It is a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor, and it basically increases by acting through increasing the bioavailability of your cyclic AMP, which increases your uh, release of your calcium channels. Uh, calcium ions. Um, it is a systemic and a pulmonary vasodilator and has got a positive ionotropic and lucotropic properties. So it basically increases your contractility. If you have um, and if you uh, are good in uh, doing performing um, echocardiography, it's always advisable or if somebody is there who can actually perform echocardiography, uh, it's always advisable that actually try and do an echo, see what your function is of your of, of your left one ventricles or your, and your right ventricles. And if you have dysfunction, which we sometimes see in babies who've got severe asphyxia, or you have got a baby with a pulmonary persistent pulmonary hypertension and your contractility is not very good, sometimes we use milrinone in those instances. And you can see that just by increasing and improving the contractility of your, um, of your myocardium improves the overall blood pressure uh, of the baby. Okay. Corticosteroids, we talked about that you, baby has got an impaired hypothalamic adrenal pituitary axis. Um, so because they have impaired axis, we actually start corticosteroids once we are on the second agent. So if we have, we have started the first agent and we have not seen a response, we will actually start hydrocortisone on these babies because they respond really well to that. And by just giving a loading dose and then just putting them on low dose um, of hydrocortisone, QDS, it actually in, improves your adrenal insufficiency. It improves your overall um, receptor and, and peripheral vascular resistance. And the, the heart is actually more responsive to stress. Um, so rather than actually leaving it till the end, we should always actually start, if you're starting with a second agent, put in that hydrocortisone and you will actually see a lot of benefits, beneficial effects of it. Obviously, we have to think about the side effects that it can cause. Um, we are using very low dose. So normally the babies tolerate that very well, but if you are using it for a prolonged period of time, um, or using in higher doses, then they actually can get lot significant side effects as a result of the corticosteroids. Okay, this is a table. I'm not going to go through this table. Um, uh, you have got the presentation um, uh, recorded, so you can look at it in your own time. It basically just tells you about the agent, what dosage they are used at, what is the mechanism of action, what are the indications, uh, what are the clinical contraindications when you should not be using these agents? So it just gives you a, just overall um, uh, mechanism and, 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 and aspects of different drugs that are used in neonates. Okay. Um, are you guys okay? Do you have any questions so far before we go to central lines? We can actually have a five minute breather and see if you have any questions. We can go through those questions now and then we will actually talk about central lines just to make it easier if you do have questions just type them in the chat and then i can moderate it a bit easier I don't know if you can see the questions in the chat, but yeah. someone's, oh yeah. So um, it is It is actually that they're different size cups. Um, so um, you have, it depends on the size of the baby. So you have obviously in neonates, you have 500 gram babies to five kilos. Um, uh, so um, there are age ranges. Um, 
the nurses will be able to tell you more than I can. Uh, but they have age range, ranges in terms of the weight ranges, not age, sorry, weight ranges of what can be used, what size cuff can be used for smaller babies. So the idea basically is that you need, that's, that's universal, is when you are actually putting the cuff of the blood pressure cuff on the baby's arm or the lower limbs, it should actually encircle three, one, th three quarters of your of your arm uh, and it, sh it should encircle the whole thing. It should not wrap around twice. It should just encircle the whole thing. Um, and then it should actually be the size should encircle about three quarters of your length of your arm. If it is actually too small, then you will have a higher blood pressure reading. If it is too big, then you will have a low, lower blood pressure reading. So there are, um, uh, when you go and speak to your nurses tomorrow, when you are actually on the unit, whenever you're on the unit, and 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 see how um, uh, different sizes, what different sizes cuffs there are, um, and what when are they used, and what what are the effects of that. Uh, Tanat has uh, Toby has asked if there is no evidence of poor end organ perfusion, should we be treating low mean blood pressure reading? Actually, that's a very good question to be honest, because. I think that's what we all struggle with. We actually look at, oh wow, uh, this is the baby's blood pressure, the baby's 26 weeker, and the baby's blood pressure is 24 uh, or 23 or um, even lower, but you don't have any evidence of low blood pressure, the end organ perfusion. I think as neonatologists, we are always overcautious and we are like, oh my God, this is this is getting getting to a territory where we are not very comfortable in leaving. But I think you have to actually have a look and you have to keep on assessing that baby and see whether this is actually, is it really affecting the end organ perfusion or not? Um, and then if it is not, then then hold tight. Um, and then just, and because the babies will be able to correct themselves very, very well. Obviously, if you have a baby 26 weeker and your blood pressure, mean blood pressure is 20, as I said, that don't just look at the mean pressure. You have to actually look at your systolic as well as your diastolic pressure. And if your systolic and diastolic are also low, then you need to actually think about, okay, what else is going on with this baby? And do we need to actually now act on this blood pressure? So it's very important. And is it accurate? Is, it, is that accurate reading of a low blood pressure? So those are all the questions before you actually kind of jump in and, and say that, okay, let's, let's treat the low blood pressure. Okay. Right, now let's move on to uh, the next uh, question. Uh, so next part, not question, next part of the presentation, so insertion of central lines. So there are different types of central lines that we use in neonates. Um, the main ones are the UAC, UVCs, and the long lines. Uh, some units use mid lines, and some units use pick lines. Um, so uh, again, they have got different usage. Um, of midlines as well as pick lines. And obviously you have the different French, you have one French, two French, three French. Three French is normally a pick line is a three French. Uh, midlines can be three French as well. Uh, and then you have different lengths. So you can have a line which varies from 20, 20 centimeters to 30 centimeters and 50 centimeters. So again, you need to understand what your unit has, uh, what type of lines they have and what type of insertion techniques they have. So every unit is slightly different, but the principles are actually quite the same. Okay. Sorry. Uh, when you are thinking about what type of line that you need to use for what type of baby, okay? So you can't use a one French line on a five kilo baby, okay? So that's completely, that obviously sometimes the baby is really very difficult. We do use it sometimes, but that one French line will last you literally 24 hours and it'll burst because it will not be able to take the amount of volume going through that. Okay, so what a ballpark figure normally is, if you have an 800 gram baby or less, then you go for one French line. And normally 20 centimeters is more than enough. But if you have a baby who's more than 800 grams, look at the veins and see whether you can actually insert a two French line because a baby who's bigger will have a larger amount of fluid running through that vessel. So if you're using a very small line in a very big baby, then that line will burst because it will not be able to take that much of fluid running through it. Okay. And if you have a baby who's term, who's big, then again, think about using 30 centimeters. And especially if you are inserting a line in the leg, 
then use think of using 50 centimeters line okay so if you use a 20 centimeters line and you're starting in the long softness in a term baby that that baby will actually the line will get stuck um, or will finish just near the groin so you have actually not actually inserted a central line so again just thinking about what is the size of the baby what is the length of the uh, baby and what length of line do i need to use okay definitely look at the vein before you choose the line okay so don't go with the line and then choose the vein okay so look at the vein and then choose the line if you have a going in the upper limbs and scalp area which sometimes we do um, use 30 centimeters or 20 centimeters line okay just think about if you have a longer line you just have to do that extra coiling all the time and then you are actually at risk of kinking of knotting of occlusion all sorts of problems so you don't want to actually do that um uh, when uh, you're inserting a line okay these are just the common sites that we use um to insert our central line so it's, it's a very nice diagram think about what line which vein you're using um back of the leg uh, it's, it's again a very kind of hidden hidden line uh, you need to have practice when you're actually using this vein specifically and uh, obviously scalp uh, if you're going for the scalp veins um, it is basically going for the external jugular uh, so just thinking about your anatomy and making sure that you are you're you're kind of going through the path of the vessel okay um some challenges you can actually have they're not always easy um so if you have a baby who is being cooled um, who's peripherally shut down again thinking about how you can actually ensure that these vessels are nice and juicy uh looking at um so thinking about whether you need to just warm up that that part of the of the body uh, or use a tourniquet to actually pump up those vessels or just give that 10 mils per kilo bolus to fill the baby up so that you actually can insert a line otherwise you'll actually be rogering all the veins if your baby is really shut down low blood pressure um if the baby has got low blood pressure is on inotropic support quite tricky they can be quite challenging uh so again thinking about what you need to do uh, increase the blood pressure um, and then start increase and in, in putting the lines some units use peripheral dopamine for a short period of time till we actually get the peripheral the, the central axis uh, yes, absolutely, you can use that um, just to uh, increase that kind of uh, filling volume, uh, give 10 mils per kilo so that you have a nice juicy vein. Babies who are edematous, they are quite tricky. Uh, again, using a good, good cold light uh, to actually get to know where your vein is, is important. Warm the local side, use a tunic, as I said, um, and, and ensure that you're holding the limb and stretching that skin. Um, especially if a baby is really kind of um, uh, growth restricted, they will have really loose skin and the vein, the vessel will actually just move under the skin. So making sure that you have actually stretched the skin properly um, and you're holding the limb, especially if the baby is not ventilated, the baby is actually moving all around and you've just got into the vein and the baby has actually just flicked the arm and then you've lost that vein. Okay. Um, unfortunately, lines go everywhere um and how to actually ensure that the line is going in the right place is is just a trick it's basically there are a few tips i will tell you but again it is it is quite tricky sometimes if the vessel if the if the line wants to go and and coil in somewhere very weird nothing you can do about it um if you if you've got into a vessel and it is actually advancing easily that is actually always a good sign okay that means you're in a big way but if you are actually hitting somewhere and it's not going easily just kind of think about it. It's like mm, probably you're entering into a small uh, uh, vein, a uh, small territory, or you are, um, it's basically coiling somewhere or it's hitting a valve. So just kind of thinking about all the possibilities and make sure that you actually aspirate it. Because if you're sitting in a big vessel, your vein front, one French lines should aspirate and it should flush well okay if you have that sign that means you're you're good you're absolutely fine you you will uh, able you you are in a big vessel somewhere um and it is it is um uh, happy days uh, for you guys okay lines from the hand they always tend to <laughs> do they they go up in the in the jugular okay so they always try to do that so what you actually do is you basically turn the neck on the side of where the, you're inserting the vein. So if you turn the other side, 
obviously the it's a nice path because it's a straight path okay so if you have turned the 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 neck away from where you're inserting the line it's a very nice straight path it'll definitely go up okay so just make sure that the baby's head is turned in the same direction as where your line is um so that to prevent that uh, line in going up up to the jugular side and then it'll definitely flip back uh into the into the superior vena cava and into the heart uh when you're securing the line i'm actually going to show you some pictures that will help you understand so this is basically you you've inserted the line so you make sure that you have a sturdy strip at the entry point of the line okay so you have one sturdy strip over there so that and then you can actually because you're using sturdy strips, you can actually see what's happening sometimes it's oozing so just making sure that it is not oozing it's nice and uh, dry sometimes you just have to stand over there for five minutes with moderate pressure on on the on the site of entry so that it is not actually bleeding uh, and once it is stopped bleeding then only start dressing otherwise what will happen is that you have actually um inserted it's still bleeding you've done a nice dressing and it's blood all under the dressing so again you have to take everything out and risk lose, losing that line okay so just make sure that you the, the vessel has stopped bleeding before you actually start putting in sturdy strips okay when you make a nice coil okay and make sure when you're coiling it make sure that it is not kinking okay so that's the reason that we tell that not to use a bigger uh, line um especially if you're using it in the arm uh, use a bigger line if you're using in a way in a, in a leg uh, so if you have a big line, then you just have to coil that all the time. Okay. So again, then you risk of that occluding somewhere. So you've nicely coiled it, uh, and then you've put sturdy strips that is covering the line, and it is nice and secure. Okay. Uh, what we at Kings do is we basically put a small duodenum uh, underneath the hub over here. So it's basically protecting the skin. Um, as well as it is protecting, uh, it is nicely, it's, it's, it's a nice cushion where it st sits. It is, duodenum is non-absorbent. So the advantage of using a duodenum as compared to a gauze is if you are actually, if the vessel is bleeding from underneath, the gauze will actually absorb it. And then you have a nice nidus of infection over there. So we use duodenum instead because it is non-absorbent. And if it is bleeding, then you actually can see the blood seeping through. Uh, and then you have to then okay think about okay fine whether I need to change this because uh, it is actually the blood is seeping through we need to change. If you use a gauze, then you can't actually see. Um, and obviously, as I said, the gauze will actually just absorb all the blood and cause an itis of infection. And then you cover the whole thing with tegaderm. You nicely seal it. So each and every part of the line should be underneath the tegaderm. So if you have any any part of the line which is outside the tegaderm, the line is exposed. So again, it's risk of actually causing infection. Uh, even the hub, end of the hub, should be actually covered nicely uh, so that it's not flailing around. So that, so that hub is not flailing around. So it is actually nice and secure. Um, and a lot of the times you don't need to use uh, uh, a splint uh, where the line is. Uh, the babies actually tolerate this very well and has got no problems in that. This is an example of a poor dressing. So you can actually see that the hub actually over here is coming off. It is not exactly underneath the tegaderm. There is nothing underneath over here as well. So there is no gauze, there's no tegaderm, uh, duoderm, um, and it actually can cause, especially in a preterm baby, uh, who's the, if the baby has got very delicate skin, you will see that this baby will start having pressure sores. So that's what you want to prevent. Um, and over here, there's a risk over here now. You're trying to take the, the, the dressing off. Um, however much appeal you use, sometimes you risk losing the line. So again, it is really important that you make sure that you have dressed on the first instance very properly. So as I said, that there is, um, if you have, uh, there's a risk, there's a bleeding over here, there's no duoderm, the line is not, not secured, um, so you actually are going to be risking losing this line very, very quickly. So again, where you form the loop is also equally important. Okay. Uh, when you're flushing the line, so when you're actually inserting the line and using flush, always, always, always use a 10 mil syringe. Okay. So you should use a 10 mil syringe 
um, because the smaller syringe you use, the higher the pressure. So you risk of bursting the lines, okay? The line can rupture if you're using a very high pressure syringe, okay? Um, what we normally say, the infusion pressure should never exceed 25 PSI. Um, see, this is a measurement that is done in the laboratory. We know for sure a smaller syringe will have a higher pressure. Uh, and if you use a bigger syringe, 10 mil syringe, always if you're using flushing a central line, whether it is an umbilical arterial line, venous line, or a long line, always use a 10 mil syringe, okay? When you're removing the line, um, obviously this is also an aseptic procedure. So make sure that you do it in the aseptic manner. Make sure that all the line is actually taken out. So you have to inspect your line. If the line has been in for four to six weeks, uh, again, there is a risk that part of the line might actually have cracked uh, and left inside the baby's body. So make sure when you have taken the line out, you have seen the number one and the tip of the line. So the whole line is out. We send at King's, we send the tip for culture. Um, and we actually, what we suggest is when you're actually taking the line out, you don't pull on the line. So if you actually think that, okay, this is getting stuck, stop, okay? Ask one of your seniors, ask one of your colleagues to actually come and see what's happening. We have actually taken babies down to theater because we have, the lines has been, they have been stuck. Um, so if that is the, the that's 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 the problem, then you need to actually just leave it rather than pulling it a line and risking a part of the line in the baby. Uh, you should not actually uh, do that. And then obviously, if it is stuck, then the surgeons will need to actually take the baby to theater to get the line out. Okay. Talking very talking uh, quickly talking about the UAC uh, position. So when you're inserting the umbilical arterial line. Uh, it is actually um, on the x-ray, the way it is identified is basically it loops down and then it goes up, okay? So if it is directly going up, that is not a UAC. A UAC always goes down into the common iliac arteries and then it goes up into the aorta. So that's how when you're actually requesting for to check line positions in a baby, you have to do a chest and an abdominal x-ray, okay, together. So they have to be, it, it is a baby gram that you need because you want to actually see what exactly that line is doing because it's very difficult to identify if you only see the tips of the lines, okay? It should be ideally between T6 and T10 uh, of the in the descending aorta uh, and basically which is just above the origin of the mesenteric and the renal arteries, okay? So if you also, if you basically are, uh, uh, around in the mesenteric arterial region, in the, in, in the renal artery and the mesenteric artery, you're risking blood supply, loss of blood supply to the kidneys and to your um, gut. And that's the reason that we actually say just higher than the mesenteric and the renal artery position. Okay? If obviously you're, you are there and you can't actually advance it further, then what we then suggest is just do a lower one. Okay, So don't actually put it in between uh, uh, below T10 level. So T10 and L3 is something that we should actually avoid. And then you actually then do a lower position UAC, uh, which is absolutely fine for the first 42, 72 hours, 48, 72 hours till you are, <coughs> sorry, till you are, in that position. Um, and then you probably have bought time to actually insert a peripheral arterial line in the meantime. Okay, so this is your ideal UAC position, the two T6 to T9. Uh, this is where you should actually have your UAC. The measurement, everybody now nowadays uses the Neomate, uh, but if you don't have a Neomate or if you don't have your phone for some reason that day, the measurement is basically three times the weight plus nine and plus stump, okay? And if you can't remember this, the easiest way to measure is basically you measure it diagonally from the shoulder to the umbilicus, okay? So your, uh, you can do a right shoulder or left shoulder to the umbilicus uh, plus one centimeter and plus the length of the stump. Okay, so if you want to measure, and this actually is very, very accurate. Okay, so your left, left shoulder, right or left shoulder to the umbilicus plus one centimeter and plus a stump is what will actually give you your UAC position. Okay. UVC is similar, it's three times the weight plus nine, and you divide that by two. Okay, and plus your stump length is give, will give you the ideal UVC position. 
if you are in emergency so you actually basically what you do is from your um, umbilicus to your uv sternum plus the stump that's what you measure uh, and then you insert the uvc and you stop when you actually get a flashback okay so when you get a flashback you just leave it over there in suture it get a position okay in an emergency if you are in a visa situation uh, you can insert you can give your adrenaline you can give your boluses you can give your blood everything through there because you are getting the flashback that means you are in a safe position and you can do that okay um the uvc position uh, should be just at the level of diaphragm between t9 and t10 okay it goes straight okay onto your on your right side uh, is your uvc on your left side is your uac okay so and the uac will go loop down and go up uvc will directly go uh from your right and will sit on the right side of the baby and you can actually see it's going straight it should be sitting at t9 to t10 position so again going through the same diagram so this is your your tip of your uvc uh, and we here you have your tip of your uac so that's where your lines should be so if you're doing an x-ray uh, and you are actually doing an X-ray. You can only see this. Yes, technically, you can actually say right side UVC, right left side UAC. Uh, but you do want to actually make sure that that is what it is. In our experience, we sometimes have got it wrong, especially in babies with congenital diaphragmatic hernia. The anatomy is completely skewed, and you're kind of figuring it out in terms of what is which line is what, and what are we doing with this one. Uh, so some we we do um, a baby gram in in our unit. Um, so, I'm actually going to uh, have a look at this x-ray. We're going to go through um, slide or poll again. So if you can take out your uh, QR code, kind of the, uh, your smartphones and your QR codes, have a look at this x-ray. And my question for you is, is the position of UVC correct? So what is the position? of the UVC. Do you want me to show you the X-ray again? Okay, so that's your X-ray. And tell me the position of the UVC. What position is the UVC at? <laughs> Okay. Anybody who can come off your microphone and talk me through how you measure, how you count your your um, position, your vertebral position. Can I go back to the X-ray again? Anyone can talk me through that? Yeah. yeah if no one else, if no one else is gonna say anything i i personally i go from the 12th rib so then i look i use that as t12 and then i count up from there but i don't know how everyone else does it okay so you can so you're going from lower down uh some people go from from the top uh and go to the bottom so where where you have got your uh, uh t2 uh, and then you basically go down. So you can either do 12th rib or up or T2 and down. Uh, so that's that's absolutely fine. Uh, so this is the, the, this is at T6. Uh, so it is it's basically just slightly on the higher side than what we would have um, ideally liked uh, in this instance. We will talk about something else that is nowadays a lot of people use, and I'm sure you all have heard. Um, we'll talk about that later on uh, in, in five minutes. Okay, so have a look at this X-ray, and I want to, you to look at the um, the long line in this X-ray. Okay, answer is simple. It's a long line 
what you want, what I want you to do, uh, tell me is, is this long line adequately placed? I want you to tell me, is this long line adequately placed? So this is the long line X-ray. Okay, so have a look at the long line and tell me, is this long line adequately placed? Would you be happy if you have this long line? Would you be happy to use this long line? Okay, so yes, you all are correct. So I, am, I will be happy to use this long line. Not quite ideal, but you would be happy because your long line is just about crossing the midline. Uh, that means you're happy that it's, it's probably sitting in a big vessel ideally would would have wanted to cross a little bit more of the midline uh, and and your your happy days you're absolutely fine no problems with that okay now the next x-ray is this line adequately placed okay is this line would you be happy to use this line if you see this line would you be happy to use this line okay is this line adequately placed A bit of a mixed response over there. Uh, okay. Okay. So, um, so that's really interesting. So some people say yes, and some people say no. Um, uh, if this is a line that somebody has really struggled, and it has been a very very difficult line. Uh, yes, <laughs> you would actually use this line for a short period of time and be very, very, very vigilant in that in the region because it can extravasate. And sometimes it can if it extravasates near the shoulder region, you will not know until quite late. Uh, so um, if this is the first attempt or the second attempt and you've put the line in, I would actually take this line out. I would not be very happy. Sorry, I would not be very happy to use this line um as such um but yes it's been if it has been a very desperate attempt um then i would just leave it in and it's like okay fine let's let's just go unfortunately we do say that you should not push the lines in because again you are actually inserting more organisms um and it's not as sterile as you have actually in so when you have inserted it so um just be mindful of that okay the next one are you happy to use this uvc don't look at the ng that is completely <laughs> it's the baby doesn't have tough don't worry about that uh we're, we're looking at the uvc so are you happy to use this uvc okay is this uvc safe to use Okay, that's a very clear no, <laughs> so that's fantastic. Yes, it is It is absolutely unsafe to use. Again, what we say sometimes is, is you are in a district general hospital, you're in a level one hospital, uh, you have got the UVC in, you're struggling uh, otherwise to get any access in, you've got that UVC in, um, and the baby is actually going to go to a tertiary level neonatal unit, then we just leave it. Okay, because it can be used for fluids. Obviously, you don't want to put anotropes in there. You don't want to put any blood products in there. You don't want to put any antibiotics in there, nothing except for 10% dextrose. So if you're struggling, leave it in, but obviously not safe to use at all. That UVC needs to come out um, and you need to replace it with either another UVC. Sometimes you railroad and you will see it still going back in, into, that, in, into that portal venous system, um, or you basically just uh, convert it into a long line. Okay, right, long line again. Is this long line safe to use? Okay, so look at the long line here. Uh, 
is this long line safe to use? Is, is, is this line adequately placed? Oh, shit. Okay. okay um, I'm very conscious of time. Sorry, apologies for that. I'm nearly coming to the end. So it is not um, adequately placed. The reason why you can actually see is that this line is actually doing a wiggle around over here. Uh, so that means it is actually getting stuck somewhere. Um, and really, you do not want to use this line at all. So this line, unfortunately, even though um, this has been very difficult, um, you would um, uh, you would not use this line. It is actually not not a good placement of the line. Okay, right. Tell me what's going on over here. So is this line adequately placed? Okay. So this is a long line, uh, and is this line safe to use? Okay. So uh, have a look at the line. <laughs> And then tell me if this is safe to use. Okay. So absolutely right. You all are right. So it is not safe to use. The, the line has done a loop. Okay. And the other thing about this line, especially the line which is there in the left leg, it has not crossed the midline, okay? So any line, this is something that remember, if you've been searching a line in the lower limbs, in the left limb specifically, that line needs to cross towards the right. That means it has actually now entered into the big, big vessels. If it has not crossed the midline, that means it is in the lumbar plexus and you should not be using that line at all. Otherwise you will be inserting that TPN or whatever into the lumbar plexus causing um, paralysis to the baby. It's quite significant uh, and can cause a lot of problems, okay? I'm not gonna go over through this because you all know this is not a line that you should be using. It's got a nice big loop. Uh, where is it is looping? No idea, but definitely not a line. If it is, in, it is looping around, you shouldn't be using that line at all. Okay, um, and then I'm just going to talk about the UVC position uh, and how you actually, uh, nowadays, we do a lot of POCUS. Okay, you heard about POCUS? Uh, so it is, um, uh, it's really gone off, out of my head <laughs> for some reason. Uh, it is a bedside ultrasound scan, uh, point of care, sorry, point of care ultrasound scan that we actually do. Um, and we actually look do to look at line positions. So we are using less and less, and I am sure a lot of tertiary units are using focus nowadays. So you insert a line, you take your ultrasound scan probe, and then you put it on, on wherever um, you've inserted the line, uh, look at the cardiac silhouette, see where you are, where the line is, and whether you can see the line. For example, over here, some of the images that um, we have taken. So you've got your uh, superior vena cava um, and your pick line is sitting over there, and this is your right atrium. Uh, similarly, you have got the IVC um, coming from below uh, and you've got your right atrium. So it is actually quite a useful tool. Again, you need to actually be, uh, have a practice of how you interpret these lines. Um, what are the positions that you need to actually hold the probe in uh, so that you actually get the right image. Uh, to ensure that the line tip is in the right position. Uh, so we are using that more and more. I'm sure wherever you are at, at, in the neonatal units, you will be learning this, this skill because it's, it's now using in use more and more, okay? These are some of the references that I've used and apologies that I'm, I've overrun by 20 minutes. I'm so sorry for that.